Hi, I'm Amy Cardoso and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Kimball Art Museum and our interviewer, Janelle Montgomery, speaks with curator Jennifer Kastler-Price about their exhibition, Queen Nefertari's Egypt. Now for Art This Week. Hi, we're here at the Kimball Art Museum with curator Jennifer Kastler Price to talk about the show Queen Nefertari's Egypt. Jennifer, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for being here. I think we need to start with a little context. Can you tell us who Queen Nefertari was? Sure. So um, she may not be that familiar to everyone. I think um, when you think about celebrated queens in Egypt, you think of um, Nefertiti, Cleopatra, Hatshepsut. But uh, Queen Nefertari was the favorite and most beloved wife of Ramses II. And he was one of the greatest pharaohs of the New Kingdom period. The New Kingdom period is 1539 to 1075 BCE. This is about a thousand years after the pyramids in Giza are built. So it's the more recent, you know, you have Old Kingdom, New Kingdom. Ramses II, who reigned from 1279 to 1213 BCE, had a very long, very prolific reign, very prosperous reign. And of his eight wives, uh, Nefertari was not only his, his most favorite, his most beloved, was also the most beautiful of his wives, um, gave him his first presumptive heir. One of the reasons she's also important is that uh, she was highly literate. She could read and write hieroglyphs. So she actually, um, when he first came to reign, they went on a number of excursions around the kingdom, sort of a meet and greet, mm -hmm. to familiarize themselves with the uh, with the population. Afterwards, she continued with um, sort of diplomatic correspondence on his behalf. And then the fact that uh, when Ernesto Schiaparelli discovered her tomb in 1904 and um, saw how large and resplendent the tomb was, that was another indication of how important she must have been to him. Because prior to discovering the tomb, um, we didn't really know too much about her. There were um, some hieroglyphic inscriptions that related to monuments that he had built. Um, there was also the temples of Abu Simbel, the Greater Temple and the Lesser Temple, which he had built the Greater Temple um, to honor himself and the god Horus and the Lesser Temple to honor Nefertari and the goddess Hathor. So there's images of her on these temples with Ramses, but then to make that discovery of the tomb uh, really does kind of set her apart. And so this uh, show is drawn from works in the um, Museo Egipto de Turin yes. in Italy. Mm -hmm. How were the works that came uh, chosen and how did you organize the exhibition? Right. So um, the Museo Egizio in Turin is, is one of the largest and also one of the oldest collections of Egyptian art outside of Cairo. The exhibition was actually organized by a museum in Montreal, the Pointe à Calière. So it has been traveling around. I had seen it in Montreal and I knew immediately that this was a show that I wanted to bring to the Kimball. I liked the um, viewpoint of looking at this period in Egypt through Nefertari's eyes and through the eyes of the other women of the New Kingdom period, both royal and commoner. In terms of the selection of objects, that was already um, slated. But when I was thinking about how I wanted to pre present the show here, um, and it's actually in two galleries in the pavilion, um, I really wanted to create kind of an atmosphere. <laughs> um, you did. <laughs> and, and, um, and a little bit of drama. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we, we actually did work with an outside design team to kind of create, um, we're sitting here in, in Nefertari's tomb and, you know, a little bit recreating what the lower chamber would have been like with her sarcophagus lid and the four pillars, mm -hmm. uh, but also just kind of the color scheme, the, the gray and um, kind of sand tones and uh, just evocative of the period and kind of evocative of, um, you know, the great temples and the royal palaces and the, the tombs where you would have found the coffins. So uh, hopefully um, I've been successful in kind of creating that mood. So the exhibition opens with four, I think, 
monumental statues of the goddess Sekhmet. Correct. What is her significance? Uh, where were these found, um, and what what uh, do they what part do they play in the story of Nefertari? Right. So uh, the goddess Sekhmet, she is the lion-headed goddess of divine wrath. She is one of the um, really important goddesses in a, a very large pantheon of Egyptian gods and goddesses. She represents. Uh, she is the daughter of the sun god Ra. And, and he is probably one of the most important gods. And she literally represents the, the pupil, the eye of Ra. She represents the, the sun's rays. Now, the sun's rays can be beneficial, but they can also be harsh. You know, they, they can parch you know, the crops, um, but they can also bring the beneficial floods of the Nile and make things grow. It was very important to the Egyptians um, who had to live with all of these um, natural forces that they didn't really understand and they didn't know how to control, but they created this pantheon of gods and goddesses that they could pray to, to help keep these uh, forces at bay. So Sekhmet, um, because she's related to the sun, has to be prayed to every day and every evening, so twice a day, 365 days That's a year. That's pretty demanding. It's very demanding. The four monumental sculptures that we have in the exhibition actually date to the reign of Amenhotep III. It's a little bit earlier than Ramses II. They come from a temple where presumably there were about 300 that were actually found, but presumably there were 365, one for each day of the year. And just incredible. I mean, the, the, the sheer scale of them, first of all, mm -hmm. and the, the magistry and the artistry and just some of the details that you see. What I, what I love is the way that um, her lion-headed mane is, is portrayed. It's, it's almost like the, the rough of the mane is like sun, the rays of the sun. Mm -hmm. And then she's holding um, an ankh, which is the symbol of life. Uh, in her hand. And so I think to start the exhibition with those those four sacraments, um, and then also there are a couple of other uh, monumental sculptures, one of Tutmos the first, and then of course the great triad mm -hmm. of Ramesses the second, seated between uh, the god Amun and the goddess Mut. So I wanted to um, again evoke the feeling that you are literally walking into an Egyptian temple. A number of the pieces, like the Sekhmet statues, uh, are made of stone, but there's also quite a few pieces of wood in the show. Yes. That was not a common material, as I understand it, in Egypt. Where did that come from? That is correct. And that was actually something that was very surprising to me when I first saw the exhibition. I think we don't normally associate wood as a material that the Egyptians might have worked in, and maybe in large part because it doesn't survive. Right. Uh, whereas this stone does. But we do know that the wood actually um, it did have to be imported from the Mediterranean. Um, that said, it, it was certainly considered as precious and as important a material as stone in terms of carving. And when you see um, several of the wood carvings in the exhibition that are definitely on a, a smaller scale, um, you know, about two, two feet, the carving is absolutely exquisite. I mean, just the level of attention and detail and sharpness to me is, is even better than some of the stone carvings. That is one of the fascinating things about having the component of Deir el Medina mm -hmm. in the exhibition, mm -hmm. which is the artisan village. Mm -hmm. um, these were the artisans that built the royal tombs. And again, the New Kingdom period represents the, the height of Egyptian civilization in terms of artistry. And so these artisans are of the, the highest level, the highest caliber. So obviously what they're creating for the royals is on a very high level, but what they create for themselves is also on a very high level. A couple of the wooden sculptures actually are from the village and represent, one represents deified um, queen, mm -hmm. Amos Nefertari, mm -hmm. and the other uh, represents just a, a worker, it was probably made as a, a kind of an icon to put into a worker's tomb. But again, the, the level of artistry is, is so high. But to have these wonderful, um, the, the tools and other implements of daily life that surrounded them, um, and again, on, on such a high level, I think speaks to how they were regarded mm -hmm. um, in Egyptian society. The, I want to ask again about some of the smaller statues. Um, 
several of them have the kind of calm, even expression that we associate so with Egyptian sculpture, but there are a couple that are really emotional in their expressions, like Queen Tia um, and the Statue of the Lady. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So what would have been different about the way those sculptures were conceived or used that allowed the artisan to be more expressive in the, in the facial um, contours? Queen Tia, of course, I mean, that, that is a historical person that we know. Mm -hmm. And there's an interesting story about her just in terms of her physical appearance, uh -huh. because apparently there are other images of her um, in, in other art forms where she's always shown with this kind of scowl. <laughs> And, that is not normal. <laughs> and it's not normal. And, and in the little wooden figure of her, where she's um, shown also in the guise of the goddess Tauret, uh, who's the pregnant hippo, mm -hmm. um, but has a, a human face, mm -hmm. she's literally kind of shown with this, you know, kind of frown. And then the statuette of a lady um, that presumably probably came out of the um, Royal Women's Palace. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a name inscribed on it, so we don't know who she is, but there is something about her face and also just her stance, even though it's so hieratic and mm -hmm. so forward and kind of static. Mm -hmm. But then um, her left knee is just slightly um, moving forward mm -hmm. and it gives the statue a, a bit of sense of movement and just the way that her clothing is kind of draped mm -hmm. and clinging to her body but um, I do think that these sculptures particularly the wood ones are it, they're imbued with a, a spirit that that kind of brings them to life mm -hmm. for us yeah definitely yes so almost everything in the exhibition is about 3,000 years old but there's one piece that's only a century old and that's the model of the tomb. Yes, yes. Um, how did that come about, and what does it tell us about yes. the, the discovery of, about the culture of its time and the culture of uh, Nefertari's time? Exactly. Um, it's actually one of my favorite pieces. So when Schiaparelli made the discovery of the tomb in 1904, um, one of the distinguishing things about the tomb was not only the size, um, but the fact that the entire tomb was um, decorated with beautifully painted murals and this depicted the perilous journey that Nefertari has to take through the underworld. So many depictions of Nefertari and other gods and goddesses of the underworld. Of course the the tomb can't be transported um, to us today or even um, back to Italy when he discovered it but realizing how important the murals were um, he actually had three members of his team who immediately set about to copy all of the murals from the tomb um, at the site. And so within just a couple of years of the discovery, they went back to Italy and they recreated the tomb. It's a 110 scale model of the tomb. So this is a historical model. And when you come to the exhibition, you can actually look inside. It's like the top is sort of covered with plexi, but you can look inside and you can see all the murals and kind of follow the path that she took. And you can see where the lower chamber is, where we've kind of recreated here. And what's really important about this model is that when the Getty Institute went in, um, in the 1980s, they went to help restore the murals. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the tomb that had fallen into disrepair. And they used this model as a guide um, because the precision of the, of the um, drawings is, you know, is incredible. It's, it's absolutely accurate. It's stunning, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The space we're sitting in right now is a recreation of her tomb, including these magnificent dejet pillars and the fragments of her sarcophagus lid. Can right. you tell us a little more about what we find here? Yes. So uh, when Schiaparelli discovered the tomb, um, of course, he uh, what he discovered was that it had already been looted in antiquity. What we have here is the broken sarcophagus lid, violently broken by the tomb robbers. Um, in order to get inside, uh, to get to the coffin. So this is just the um, outer covering of um, what would have been the interior coffin, which was probably wood, but likely gilt. Mm -hmm. 
and maybe there was also a gilt mummy mask, mm. and anything else of um, high value the tomb robbers would have taken. So there was very little that was left in the tomb, but we have the lid, um, we have her sandals. These are queen, presumably they're the queen's sandals. Um, there's a, a mural uh, image in the tomb that shows her seated at a gaming table playing the game of Senet, and she is wearing the same sandals. And then we also have, some people will um, find intriguing, I'm sure, um, her mummified knees. These were the only remains of her body, of the mummy, that were discovered. Looking at the proportions, we can presume that she was about 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, which was... Would have been kind of tall at it, that time. She was yeah. uh, taller than about 80% of the women of her time. The sandals are size 9. <laughs> Uh, you know, we don't know the origins of Nefertari. She, um, we don't know if she was Egyptian or if she came from another kingdom. So um, that's an interesting thing to ponder. And then another object that um, I really love that's uh, probably the most precious object that was left behind um, is one of these jed pillars. Mm. Um, so we see them here painted on the columns, but there's a small amulet and it's made out of gold and blue faience. And faience is a material that was, um, the blue color was considered magical to the Egyptians. It represented the blue of the Nile, of life, of um, regeneration, of the brilliance of eternity. So it's, it's also something that um, is related to uh, the afterlife. And so this tiny little, and it's inscribed with Nefertari's name on the back. And it was the only thing that was found in the tomb in its original place. It was um, set inside a little uh, niche in the wall. Pretty much almost everything that was left in the tomb here in the exhibition, in addition to also 34 shoptis that were uh, in her tomb that are inscribed with her name and also with a spell from the Book of the Dead that animates them uh -huh. uh, in the afterlife. So um, I hope what people will feel like is when they when they come into this room it's really as if they're they're stepping back in time and stepping into Scaparelli's shoes and making that that wonderful discovery. Well thank you so much for joining us today. Oh thank really you. Really appreciate it. We want to thank Jennifer for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition go to KimballArt.org. That's it for art this week. Thanks for watching. Find all of our videos and sign up for our newsletter at artthisweek.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter.